Hi, and welcome to Data Cloud Catalyst Women in Tech Roundtable Panel Discussion. I am so excited to have three fantastic female executives with me today who have been driving transformation through data throughout their entire career. With me today is Lisa Davis, SVP and CIO of Blue Shield of California. We also have Nishita Henry, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at Deloitte, and Teresa Briggs, who is on a variety of board of directors, including our own very own Snowflake. Welcome ladies. Thank you. So Thank I'm just going to dive right in. You all have really amazing careers and resumes behind you. I'm really curious throughout your career, how have you seen the use of data evolve throughout your career? And Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Thank you. You know, haven't been in technology my entire career. Um, technology and data has really evolved from being the province of a few in an organization to frankly being critical to everyone's business outcomes. Now every business leader really needs to embrace data analytics and technology. We've been talking about digital transformation probably the last five, seven years. We've all talked about disrupt or be disrupted. At the core of that digital transformation is the use of data data and analytics that we derive insights from and actually improve our decision-making by driving a differentiated experience and capability into market. So data has involved as being, I would say almost tactical in some sense over my technology career to really being a strategic asset of what we leverage personally in our own careers, but also what we must leverage as companies to drive a differentiated capability and experience and remain relative in the market today. Nishita, curious your take on how you've seen data evolve. Yeah, I, I agree um, with Lisa. It has definitely become a the lifeblood of every business, right? It used to be that there were a few companies in the business of technology. Every business is now a technology business. Every business is a data business. It is the way that they go to market, shape the market and serve their clients. Um, whether you're in construction, whether you're in retail, whether you're in healthcare, it doesn't matter, right? Data is necessary for every business to survive and thrive. And I remember at the beginning of my career, it was, you know, data was always important, but it was about storing data. It was about giving people individual reports. It was about supplying that data to one person or one business unit in silos. And it then evolved right over the course of time into integrating data and to saying, all right, how does one piece of data correlate to the other? And how can I get insights out of that data? Now it's gone to the point of how do I use that data to predict the future? How do I use that data to automate the future? How do I use that data, not just for humans to make decisions, but for other machines to make decisions, right? Which is a big leap um, and a big change in how we use data, um, how we analyze data and how we use it for insights and evolving our, our businesses. Yeah, it's really changed so tremendously just in the past five years, it's amazing. So Teresa, we've talked a lot about the data cloud. Where do you think we're heading with that? And also, how can future leaders really guide their careers you know, in data, especially in those jobs where we don't traditionally think of them in the data science space? Curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, since I'm on the Snowflake board, I'll talk a little bit about the Snowflake data cloud. Now we're getting your company's data out of the silos that exist all over your organization. We're bringing third-party data in to combine with your own data. And we're wrapping a governance structure around it and feeding it out to your employees so that they can get their jobs done. And it's as simple as that. Um, I think we've all seen the pandemic accelerate the digitization of our work. And if you ever doubted that the future of work is here, it, it is here. And companies are scrambling to catch up by providing the right amount of data, uh, collaboration tools, workflow tools for their workers to get their jobs done. You know, it used to be, as prior people have mentioned, that in order to you know, work with data, you had to be a data scientist. But you know, I, I was an auditor back in the day, and we used to work on 16 column spreadsheets. And now if you're an accounting major coming out of college, joining an auditing firm, you have to be tech and data savvy because you're going to be extracting, manipulating, analyzing and auditing data, that massive amounts of data that sit in your client's IT systems. I'm on the board of Warby Parker and you might think that their most valuable asset is their amazing frame collection, but it's actually their data. They're a 360 degree view of the customer. 
And so if you're a merchant or you're in strategy or marketing or talent or the co-CEO, you're using data every day in your work. And so I think it's going to become a ubiquitous skill that any, anyone who's a knowledge worker has to be able to work with data. Yeah, I think it's just going to be organic to every role going forward in the, yeah. in the industry. So Lisa, curious about your thoughts about data cloud, the future of it, and you know, how people can really leverage it in their jobs from future leaders. Yeah, absolutely. You know, most enterprises today are, I would say, hybrid multi-cloud enterprises. What does that mean? That means that we have data sitting on-prem, we have data sitting in public clouds through software as a service applications. We have a data everywhere. Most enterprises have data everywhere. Certainly those that have owned infrastructure or weren't born on the web. One of the areas that I love that data cloud is addressing is the area around data portability and mobility. Because I have data sitting in various locations through my enterprise, how do I aggregate that data to really drive meaningful insights out of that data to drive better business outcomes? And uh, at Blue Shield of California, one of our key initiatives is what we call an experience cube. What does that mean? It means how do I drive transparency of data between providers, members, and payers? So that not only do I reduce overhead on providers and provide them a better experience, our hospital systems, our doctors, but ultimately, how do we have the member um, have at their power of their fingertips the value of their data holistically so that we're making better decisions about their healthcare. You know, one of the things Teresa was talking about was the use of this data and I would drive to data democratization. We got to put the power of data into the hands of everyone, not just data scientists. Yes, we need those data scientists to help us build AI models to really drive and tackle these tougher, tougher challenges and business problems that we may have in our environments. But everybody in the company, both on the IT side, both on the business side, really need to understand of how do we become a data insights driven enterprise? Put the power of the data into everyone's hands so that we can accelerate capabilities, right? And leverage that data to ultimately drive better business results. So as a leader, as a technology leader, Part of our responsibility, our leadership is to help our companies do that. And that's really one of the exciting things that I'm doing in my role now at Blue Shield of California. Yeah, it's a really, really exciting time. I want to shift gears a little bit and focus on women in tech. So I think in the past five to 10 years, there has been a lot of headway in this space, but the truth is women are still underrepresented in the tech space. So what can we do to attract more women into technology, quite honestly. So Nishida, curious what your thoughts are on that. Great question. And I am so passionate about this for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is I have two daughters of my own. Um, and I know how important it is um, for women and young girls to actually start early in their love for technology and data and, and, and all things digital. Right, So I think it's one very important to start early, start an early education, building confidence of young girls that they can do this, um, showing them role models. You know, we at Deloitte just partnered with Ella the Engineer to actually make comic books centered around um, young uh, girls and boys uh, in the early uh, elementary age to talk about how heroes in tech solve everyday problems. Um, and so really helping to get people's minds around tech is not just in the back office coding on a computer. Tech is about solving problems together that help us as citizens, as customers, right? And as, as humanity. Um, so I think that's important. I also think we have to expand that definition of tech as we just said. It's not just about right database design. It's not just about um, you know Java and Python coding. It's about design. It's about the human machine interfaces. It's about how do you use it to solve real problems and getting people to think in that kind of mindset makes it more attractive and exciting. And lastly, I'd say, look, we have a absolute imperative to get a diverse population of people, not just women, but minorities, um, you know, those with other types of backgrounds, disabilities, et cetera, involved, because this data is being used to drive decision making. And if Absolutely. we're not all involved, right, and in how that data makes decisions, it can lead to unnatural biases that no one intended, but can happen just because we haven't involved a diverse enough group of people around it. 
Absolutely. Lisa, curious about your thoughts on this. Oh, I agree with everything Nishida said. Um, I've been passionate about this area. I think it, it starts with first, we need more role models. We, we need more role models as women uh, in these leadership roles throughout various sectors. And it really is it starts with us and helping to pull other women forward. So I, I think it certainly it's part of my responsibility. I think all of us as female executives that if you have a seat at the table to leverage that seat at the table to drive change, to bring more women forward, more diversity forward into the boardroom and into our executive suites. I also wanna to touch on a point Nishita made about women, we're the largest consumer group in the company. Um, yet we're consumers, but we're not builders. This is why it's so important that we start changing that perception of what tech is. And I agree that it starts with our young girls. We know the data shows that we lose our young girls by middle school, very heavy peer pressure. It's not so cool to be smart or do robotics or be good in math and science. We start losing our girls in middle school. So they're not prepared when they go to high school and they're not taking those classes in order to major in these STEM fields in college. So we have to start the pipeline early um, with our girls. And then I also think it's a measure of what your boards are doing. What is the executive leadership and your goals around diversity and inclusion? How do we invite more diverse population to the decision-making table? So it's really a combination of efforts one of the things that certainly is concerning to me is during this pandemic, I think we're losing one in four women in the workforce now because of all the demands uh, that our families are having to navigate through, through this pandemic. Uh, the last statistic I saw in the last four months is we've lost 850,000 women in the workforce. This pipeline is critical to making that change in these leadership positions. Yeah, it's really a critical time. I want to ask you, Teresa, what would be a call to action to everyone listening, both men and women, since it needs to be solved by everyone, to address the gender gap in the industry? Um, I'd encourage each of you to become an active sponsor. Uh, research shows that women and minorities are less likely to be sponsored than white men. Sponsorship is a much more active form than mentorship. Sponsorship involves um, helping someone identify career opportunities and actively advocating for them in those roles, opening your network, giving very candid feedback. And we need men to participate too. There are not enough women in tech to pull forward and sponsor the high potential women that are in our pipelines. And so we need you to be part of the solution. Rashida, real quickly, what would be your call to action to everyone? I'd say look around your teams see who's on them and make deliberate decisions about diversifying those teams. As positions open up, make sure that you have a diverse set of candidates, make sure that there are women that are part of that team um, and make sure that you are actually hiring and putting people into positions based on potential, not just experience. And real quickly, Lisa, what would your, be, your call to action be? Well, it's hard to, um, what Nishida and what Tricia shared, I think were very powerful actions. I think it starts with us. Uh, taking action at our own table, making sure you're driving diverse panels and hiring, um, setting goals for the company, having your board engaged and holding us accountable and driving to those goals uh, will help us all see a better outcome with more women at the executive table and diverse populations. So I want to talk to you all about a pivotal moment in your career. It could have been a mentorship. It could have been um, maybe a setback in your career or maybe a time that you really took a risk and it paid off big. Something that really helped define your career going forward. Curious what those moments were for you all in your career. Teresa, we'll start with you. Sure. I had a great sponsor and he was a white male, by the way. He identified some potential in me when I was early in my career, about five years in, and he really helped pave the way for a number of decisions I made along the way to take different roles in the firm. I was at Deloitte. Uh, he's still in my life today. We get together a couple times a year, and even though we're both retired from Deloitte, we, uh, we still have that relationship. And what that taught me was how to be a great sponsor. And so one of the most satisfying things I did in my career was when I finally got to the place where I was no longer 
reaching for the next rung of the ladder for myself, I got to turn around and pull through all these amazing future leaders into roles that were going to help them accelerate their careers. What about you, Lisa? I think there's been many of those moments. One I'll speak about is having spent, you know, 20, 25 years in technology, I had spent um, my first career in Department of Defense, moved over to academia, and then went to a high tech firm on their IT side, really in hopes of getting the CIO role, having been a CIO. Um, I did not get the CIO role and really had uh, a decision to make. One of the opportunities that was presented to me was to move to the business side, to run a $9 billion P&L on one of the core business units within the company. And of course, I was terrified. Uh, it was a very risky decision, having never run a P&L before and not starting small, going right to the billion dollar mark in terms of what that would look like. And frankly, decided to seize that opportunity and have certainly learned in my career that those opportunities that really push you out of your comfort zone that take you down a, di a, a really completely different path or where the greatest opportunities for growth and learning occur. So I did that role for three and a half years before coming into my current role, back to a CIO role at Blue Shield of California in healthcare and just a tremendous amount of learning having been on the business side and managing a P&L that I now apply to how I engage with my partners at Blue Shield. I couldn't agree more. I think pushing, forcing yourself out of that comfort zone is so critical for, for learning and driving your career, for sure. Nishita, what about you? Yeah, I agree. Lots of pivotal moments, but I'll talk about one very early in my career. Um, actually was an intern. Um, and one of my responsibilities was to help research back then facial recognition technology. And I had to go out there and evaluate vendors and take meetings with vendors and figure out, all right, which ones do we want to actually test? And I remember I, I was um, kind of leading a meeting. Um, two of my kind of supervisors were with us. Um, and I know I went through the list of questions and then the meeting kind of ended. And I didn't speak up at that point in time to kind of say, here are the next steps or here's what I recommend. I kind of looked at my supervisors to do that, just assuming, right, they should be wrapping it up um, and they should be the ones to make a final decision or choice. Um, and after that meeting, um, he came to me and he's like, you know, Nishida, you did a really nice job in, in bringing these technologies forward, but I wish you would have spoken up because you're the one who've done the most research and you're the one who has the most background on what we should do next. Um, next time, don't stand by and let someone else be your voice. Um, and it was so powerful for me. And I realized, wow, okay, I should have more confidence in myself <laughs> to be able to actually use my voice and do what I was asked to do versus leave it to someone else because I assumed that I was too junior or I assumed I didn't have enough experience. Um, so that was really pivotal for me early in my career um, to learn how to use my voice. I'm really curious for you, Nishida, what drew you to the industry of data? Like what was something when you were young that drew you into that space? Yeah, so, you know, my background is actually in, in engineering and it's actually funny, it's in electrical engineering. I, and um, I probably couldn't do another thermal dynamics equation to save my life anymore. <laughs> um, but when I, what I, what drew me to technology was problem solving, right? It was all about how do I take a bunch of data and information and create a new solution? right? Whether it was, how do I create a device? I remember in college, right? Creating a device to go down stadium steps and clean, right? Okay, how do I take data um, for how this machine will interact with the environment in order, in order to create it, right? So I always viewed it as problem solving. Um, and that's what has always attracted me into the field. That's great. So Teresa, I'm curious, what, at what point did you feel that you really found your voice in your career, in yourself, as a part of your professional life? Yeah, about 12 years into my career, I started working as an M&A partner. And um, I was working with a private equity firm along with their lawyers and other advisors, bankers, and so forth. And what I realized in that situation was that I was the expert in what I did. Uh, and so, you know, it, I mean, I haven't, I, I found my voice before that in many other ways, but that was sort of a moment where I felt like, okay, I'm here to deliver uh, an expertise to this group of people. None of them have the expertise that I have. 
And so I need to just stand firm in my shoes and deliver that expertise with confidence. That's great. Lisa, what about you? What was that moment that you felt that you just found your voice kind of in your groove and that confidence kicked in? You know, I don't know if it was exactly a moment, but it was certainly a realization. You know, right out of college, um, I was working for the federal government in Department of Defense and um, certainly male dominated. um, And through that, realized that to be heard, I had to become very good at what I do. Um, so I built that confidence, um, frankly, by delivering results and capability and becoming um, an expert in the work and the, um, the essentially the services that I provide. And when you become very good at what you do, regardless of what you look like, then people will start to listen. So I think it starts with delivering results. I think you have to build your confidence. And through that, you find to use your voice so that you are being heard. Having worked in Department of Defense and academia and high tech, I've had to leverage that throughout my entire career, ultimately for my voice to be heard and to be represented um, within the roles that I was playing. That's great. I know, you know, one of the things that we've also talked about is just the value, the business value, the importance of having a diverse workforce and a diverse team and the value that that brings to the outcomes. What are some of your strategies to create those types of teams? What as as leaders in your company, you know, you manage a team and, and what is your advice to them, your strategies to get a diverse pool of candidates and a diverse team? Nishida, what about you? Um, I think it's, you know, looking beyond what the individual role is, right? So a lot of times we have a role description and you want these certain skills. And so there you, or you get a certain set of candidates, right? I think it's taking a step back and saying, what are the objectives of my team? What am I trying to accomplish? What types of business, um, you know, acumen do I need on that team? What types of tech acumen? What types of personalities Um, You know, do I want people who know how to work with others and therefore bring them together? Do I need people who are also drivers and know how to get things done, right? It's finding the right chemistry. Um, Delight, we have a business chemistry, you know, talk track around. We need all different kinds to make a really good team. Um, So I think it's taking a step back and understanding what you need the makeup of your team to be, understanding the hard skills and the soft skills, and then thinking about what are all the sources you could really go to for them. And being a little bit non-traditional and saying, do I need a full-time person all the time to do this job that's sitting here? Can I be more diverse in finding people from the crowd? Can I have part-time resources? Can I use different pieces and parts of the ecosystem to actually bring together the full team that represents the diversity? Um, It's just expanding our mind and stop thinking about it role to person, you know, start thinking about it as the makeup of a team to the outcome you desire. Yeah, it's really about being creative and just thinking in new ways. Teresa, I'm super curious, since you sit on a bunch of different boards, what kind of strategies do you see companies taking um, to attract different talent? Yeah, so I can address that from the board lens for sure. And, you know, boards are probably one of the least diverse bodies in business right now, but that is changing. And for the better, um, you know, they were traditionally kind of white male dominated. And then we've had this wave of women joining boards. And now we're starting to see a wave of of diverse individuals join boards And with each person who's diverse that joins a board that I'm on, the dynamic of the discussion changes because they bring a different perspective. They bring a different way of thinking. They came from a different background or a different functional skill set or a different geography or you name whatever element of diversity you want to see. We just added the head of Apple Music to the ServiceNow board. And so you might scratch your head and say, wow, the head of Apple Music in an enterprise software company that is a B2B software company but he thinks deeply about how the end user consumes, in his case, content, and in our case, software. And so he's able to bring just a completely different perspective to the discussion we have at the board table. And I think at the end of the day, that's what diversity is all about, is you know, improving the outcome of whatever it is, if you're you know, you know, producing something or making important decisions like we do in boardrooms. That's amazing. Lisa, real quickly, what are, what are some of your strategies? Yeah, well, we know diverse teams actually produce better business results. So there's no reason, you know, there's absolutely no reason why 
we shouldn't think in that lens. I think it starts with our hiring and the makeup of our teams. I think it requires more than creativity though. You have to be very purposeful. I'm in the process of hiring four leadership positions on my team. And I, it's really to me almost like a puzzle piece of diverse perspectives and knowledge and capabilities that come together that ultimately create a high performing team. But I can't tell you how many times I got to go back to HR and say, I need to see more diverse talent. Are there any more women in the pool? One of the things we've struggled with to get more women into the roles is, and we heard this from Cheryl Siemberg, you know, as women, we, we feel we need to meet every qualification on an application, whereas men, you know, oh, I got a couple, I'm good to go, and they throw their name in the hat. They take much more risk than we do as women. So we need to encourage our women to get out of your comfort zone. You don't need to meet every qualification. What, Nish what Nishida was saying of thinking more broadly about what this role requires and the type of individual that we're looking for, but be purposeful in terms of driving to diversity um, as our end result. That is so true what you just said. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Really interesting to hear all your strategies and thanks for sharing.